The rumors are true. I will holler, scream, shout, yell, jump up and down. I will call you dummies. Some of you will cry. But there's a reason for that. Ladies and gentlemen, the master, George Alston. Hi, everybody. I'm here today with the one and only George Alston. Hi, George. Hello. How's it going there? It's as well as can be expected with this uh, virus stuff, but... You two are keeping busy, though? Marianne's good? Oh, yeah. I, re I rebuilt. I did some stuff. I did some handiwork in the house, all my honeydew lists and all that, which <laughs> Marianne's really good at creating, you know, so... Good. And Marianne's good, then? Yeah, she's good. You know, she's she's bored as hell. So we jump in the car and go down to Assateek Seashore and uh, see the beach and whatever, which is about five miles away. So well, that's nice. Yeah, I go for drives myself. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna just gonna ask you some basic questions. I, I'm glad you you agreed to join us, though, George. I'm really excited about this one. Can you tell me, George, how did you get involved in dogs? When I was born, I was born blind in my left eye. And my father didn't want me to participate in contact sports, which did not preclude me from playing sandlock hockey, sandlock football, <laughs> uh, whatever, without pads, which he never knew about. But he decided to get me involved in dogs. Our next door neighbor bred standard pooters at the Champaign, Illinois show. When I was eight and a half years old, I showed a standard poodle in junior showmanship because we were allowed to do it. And that was in 1947. Okay. <laughs> that was a couple of years ago. A few. Yep. So that got you involved. Your dad got you involved then basically. Yeah. My dad, actually the whole family did. Um, the name of our breed, we bred, we ended up breeding boxers. Uh, our original handler when we were out in Illinois was Larry Downey. Oh, wow. And, uh, and Phil Marsh. And, uh, along the way, George Rood showed for us. And, um, we also had Gordon Barton, who was Connie Barton's husband. Great boxer handlers, by the way, all of them. Yeah. Wow. And um, so I, I showed boxers in juniors. I worked for as crate boy for uh, Nate Levine, uh, Roy Holloway, uh, Gordon Barton. And it's, uh, you know, ironic that I worked as a crate boy for Roy Holloway, and yet his son came to work for me and apprentice of me. Yeah, I was just going to say that. <laughs> But it's, um, you know, I was very lucky to come along when I did. Uh, my father bought some very good dogs. Uh, he bought a bitch from um, the breeders of Duke of Highwind, which was being campaigned same time as Bangaway was. Uh, and it was Duke of Highwind's little sister. Uh, her name was High Winds Duke's Triumph. And, um, excuse me, High Winds Zach's Triumph. And so we, we bred some that, got involved with uh, Joe Gregory. He's, his clients sold us a couple boxers. And, uh, that's how it all got started. So when you first walked in the ring with a standard poodle, though? Yeah, it was with a standard poodle, and it's ironic, my first all-breed best in show was with a standard poodle. I thought it was a miniature poodle. Uh, excuse, you're right, I'm sorry. It was a... I have the picture, so you're holding it. It's got to be a miniature poodle. Uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not that big, no. <laughs> and, uh, no, but it's ironic that my my first best in show was with a poodle, and um, my a lot of my 
first best in Jersey with poodles. I had some with some sporting dogs, but uh, I showed just about everything, I guess. Yeah, you did. Okay, so you were you were you went juniors at the Garden. What year was that? 1954, the same year that uh, Ted Young went best in show with Rise and Shine. Oh, okay. Wow. And the the day two days before was American Boxer Club specially. I was 14, and I'm showing our specials dog, uh, Champion Barmer's Talisman, who was Bangaway's first champion. Oh. And it was that, I was very fond because as a kid, I was a kid younger than that, I worked for Nate Levine, I got to groom Bangaway. I had my hands on Bangle. That's incredible. <laughs> and, and you think also too, I helped groom as a kid, Rock Falls Colonel, the English setter. <laughs> you know, right there we're talking 200 and some old breed best in shows between the two dogs. So, and where I learned, uh, you know, judges such as Alva Rosenberg was, was, uh, in our house for dinner many times. So is Nate Levine, and a, a lot of great dog people. Uh, Welcome knowledge so, there. So I was uh, showing my boxer special at American Boxer Club, and it came down, uh, Mr. Wagner was judging um, boxers, um, a very famous boxer breeder from Illinois. They came down between Larry Downey with spark plug and me. And here this little kid is out there against Larry Downey, one of the greats, you know. I mean, I mean he was, he did his own thing. He, nobody ever showed a dog like Larry Downey did, you know. And I don't think anybody could copy what he did. And so there's Joe Gregory and um, Bob Forsyth giving me hints, hey kid, do this, hey kid, do that. Well, it ended up that somebody said it was like 25, 30 minutes between the two, two of us. <laughs> and I'm following Joe Gregory's order, some other hammer who happened to be close, and damn near one that son of a bitch. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> uh, you can cut that out. <laughs> uh, no, it stays, that's you. <laughs> that was, and there I was. I, we went up to the garden in a in a pickup truck. We lived on a farm in Virginia, and and a homemade crate in the back of the pickup truck. And the dog and I are up front, sitting in the seat, going into New York. I had never been to New York, and um, I had my brand new. Sears and Robot catalog suit and squeaky Sears and Buck Robot shoes is squeaked. <laughs> and my suit was too big, as you can see in it, you'll see in, see in the picture on the thing. And all the kids made fun of me because I talk so funny. Because being from Virginia, I mean, I had an accent in those days that you could cut it with a butter knife, you know. I mean, it was thick. And they called me peanut picker. <laughs> And, you know, and kids can be cool. They can be. Especially when you have all those city folks up there and here comes country boy <laughs> that talks funny. And <laughs> so they they picked on me. I, I never said a word. Never said a word. But in, in that, uh, there were several people that ended up as great hammers. Probably the best one in that juniors class was Tom Glassford. Oh, wow. Okay. Tom. Tom Glassford went third or fourth, I think. He never forgot it. He, 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 would, he just, <laughs> and I didn't, I, and I rubbed it in for 30 years, too. No, <laughs> not you. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, I used to play all kinds of tricks on, that was, uh, I was a great, um, whole practical jokes on people that was, it was, it was, that I had a lot of fun with. 
Uh, I can't imagine, George. Yeah. Yeah. We, we, <laughs> one of the things is I, I had a uh, I I had a spray bottle that I put a water and a little bit of cream in that I would spray on the brush and then do it on top of the coach. You didn't spray it on a coat. You spray it on a brush. On the, well, you know that. You've been there. And um, somebody asked me what it was. I said, oh, this is super stuff. Yeah, there, there's only one place to get it. And it's something I, I make up just for myself. And so I wrote, it was big with a magic marker, super stuff. Well, do you know how many bottles of super stuff got stolen? <laughs> out of my and I caught this one guy and I made a brand new batch up and I took it over to him and handed it to him I said next time don't steal it just ask <laughs> so you, you won the garden that year when did you first start really working for a handler who was your you first full, oh you mean full my first apprenticeship yeah for Lena Basquette uh, 25 bucks a week, 127 Great Danes and me. <laughs> we went to the garden with 12 Danes. And I took them from the Roosevelt Hotel over to the old garden. This was at the old garden. And I took six at a time. And I, I looked like, what's his name with the chariots? Uh, ben Hur. <laughs> ben Hur. So I, and, and I had to go through gangland with the, the big high school there, there was all kinds of gang members there. And, and, and here this young kid going through there and I got all the gang bangers there, razzing me. I said, watch out, these suckers bite, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they really didn't bug you, six great Danes. But, but then having to take care of 12 great Danes on the, on the bench. Oh God. <laughs> and, and then that was the year Lena won this working group with Stormy Rudio. So, so I had a good, you know, that was a good thing. Um, that working there, my father disowned me because I had five s swimming scholarships, um, Harvard, Yale, Cornell, University of Pennsylvania, and Indiana University. And uh, I had two merit scholarships to any college in the country. And Unfortunately, he never lived long enough to see me be successful. And, uh, but if I ever had to do it again, oh, and I gave up going to the Olympics also because I had qualified for the Olympics in swimming. Yeah. And I would do the same thing again uh, because timing wise, I was able to work for some of the greatest people and each one taught me something different yeah. uh lena taught me it was a dog show if you ever have ever seen lena show a dog it was a dog show yeah you know, with what the dog looked like it was a show <laughs> uh janie forsyth thought i was with her for three years when did you start with bob and jane the year after I worked, I worked for Lena for one year and then went immediately. Well, I said, at the end of working for Lena, I said, okay, I'm going to do what make do something that my father wants. And so I applied for um, jobs as a lab tech, a chemistry lab tech at DuPont and a couple of, well, DuPont hired me. And uh, they said they put me as far through college as I wanted. I had the highest score they've ever had on anybody that applied there, all pending the physical examination. And they turned, my, turned me down because I was blind in one eye. And uh, so I said, well, somebody upstairs said, I'm not supposed to do this. And so then I was showing a boxer at the uh, Potomac, especially Janie Forsyth comes up and she says, Hey kid, what are you doing? There's a dog down here. Where, where's Lena? I said, I don't work for Lena anymore. She says, you don't you want John? And I was, um, 
working for Jenny the day that she moved from Holliston, Mass to Southbury, Massachusetts, and uh, worked for her for three years. She taught me how to run it like a business. Yeah. And was she with Bob at the time? Or not no, yet? no, she was. Uh, they were not married. I won't go into what was going on there, but <laughs> no. Uh, no, but I but I drove one truck and she rode in Bob's truck, and uh, <laughs> it was uh, it was sort of like Lena because with Lena we would travel with maybe ten or twelve Danes. I drive one car, she drive the other one. They didn't have vans then, yeah. And uh, and then I worked for. Art Baines. And Art Baines was an old setter hammer from up in Massachusetts. And he taught me the difference between the three setters. And everybody thinks they're same dog painted a different color. And they're so different in temperaments and personalities and structure and, and, and people people don't understand that. Ninety percent of the judges don't understand this. And hell, I can spot a well, but then also that could be useful. And and art taught me this also. He says if you go in to show a Gordon Setter and there's a whole bunch of Gordon Setter specials in there that are the same, trim and show your Gordon like an Irish. Be different, don't, you know. So my first Gordon special was after Nuns Yank of Rock of Plenty that I showed like a black and tan Irish. <laughs> he won the group in Madison Square Garden, number one Gordon in the country for three years, shown like an Irish until he was in the veterans class. And then he was shown like a Gordon Center. So, and then I had six years with Bill Trader. Great man, great man. Um, he was probably gave me one of my was one of the best moves I ever made because he allowed me to do my own thing. He was not a believer in hands-on teaching. He was a true mentor. He guided. He didn't teach. He guided. He did not agree with the way I trimmed sporting dogs, but he didn't fight it because he was winning, so he didn't care. <laughs> And, but if he saw me going off way off a little bit, he'd sort of nudge me back towards the center. And, but he allowed me to do my own thing, both in presentation and my presentation was nothing like the way he did. The way I trimmed was nothing like. Uh, my deportment, nothing was the same. But he allowed me to be me instead of being a which was it was something that was great it was something it was a true gift and then i had teachers that never knew that they taught me and the forward in my book states is for my teachers knowingly and unknowingly Dick Cooper, probably the greatest sporting dog man, total sporting dog man of all time. But he also taught me, don't show what you're expected to show. He showed a Labrador, um, yellow lab, made it number one sporting in the country, won the Quaker Oats with it. He showed it like an Irish center. Took the lead off, stretched it, there it was, elegant, the whole thing. Everybody else is showing labs, standing there baiting with this little dumb 
dumb looking things. And here he is out there with this thing stretched. And I said, why? He says, why should I look like everybody else? And then the, one of the greatest setter men. Did you ever know Horace Hollins? No, I didn't. No, I didn't know great, great man, great man. I knew his daughter very well. Oh, well, she was Carol. a great lady. Carol was a great lady, great lady. She was an AKC rep for a while. Yeah, but, she, showed a, she showed a lot up here when I was younger. When um, I was up at, I was working for Bill Trader, and we went to the old sportsman show up in Canada, which I loved. I Because of that show, you damn near had me as a next door neighbor up there, I tell you. Because I, in those days, I loved Toronto. I understand I wouldn't like it now, but in those days, it was a sleepy town. It has its, mo has its area. Uh, you know, and the old sportsman show was, uh, was so <clears throat> I had, Bill had this English setter he was showing, Sir Kip of Manitou, but we didn't have any kennel. So I had to trim at the show. And um, so I'm, we picked Kippy on the way up, going up to the sportsman show, and we had a whole day before. So I'm there trimming on, on Kippy, where Horace Hollins comes and sits, just sits down. Doesn't say a word, just sits there. I'm thinking, here I can hear this. Oh, sh damn, what? The <laughs> You know, I mean, when somebody that is your idol comes and sits down and watches you trim. Yeah, I've never had that happen, George. <laughs> you know better than that. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, it, it can shake you up, as you well know. And for four and a half hours, he sat there watching it, never moved. Went to the bathroom once or twice, but... <laughs> Uh, you know, then he came back and he sat and he watched. And um, he reached in his pocket and he had handed me one of his old blue handled stripping knives. He says, Here, try this, you'll like it. He says, By the way, kid, you'll go far. That was one of the greatest compliments that I could have had. And, and I just stood there in awe, you know, I said, I, I just couldn't understand. But that's about where I got my education from. Uh, 12 years, actually 12 years of full-time apprenticeships. So. That's unheard of anymore. You know. Oh, no. Exactly. I mean, I told my doctor, I went to school longer than you did, son. <laughs> so, oh. you, so you left your own, when did you go on your own? Do you remember what year that was? I went on my own in 1970 uh, after working for Bill Trainer. Um, uh, Mary Ann and I were mar got married, and two days later opened up Fieldstone Kennels that we leased from Bob Bobby Fisher. Oh, okay. And uh, Bobby was a dear friend. I've known Bobby for years, and so was Susie. I knew Susie Heckman also too, and. Uh, so they inherited her mom's place. So his kennel in Pasadena, Maryland, he asked me if we, so we leased it for a month's rent and we walked in there with a month's rent and 10 bucks <laughs> and blew the $10 on a couple of beers to celebrate. And it, that started Fieldstone Kennels. And to get it off the, in those days, you had to apply for a license. It took a year to get your license. Your handling license. Yeah, you had to be licensed in those days. And uh, and they didn't have limited licenses. It was a full-blown license. And I was, actually, I was originally on my own in 1961, at least to Kennelman, New Jersey, and turned my license back in and said, I don't know enough and went back and apprenticed. That was after leaving Janie. Yeah. I, was on, I was on my own for a year, I guess, year and a half. And said, I don't, I don't, 
I need more. And uh, I turned it back in. Everybody said I was nuts. I said, no, I said, if you're going to go anywhere and be anybody, you got to learn it all. So, yeah, uh, so I turned it back in, and that's when I went to work for uh, Art Baines. And uh, so when we started Fieldstone, I worked at Holiday, Holiday Inn at night from 11 at night till 7 in the morning doing a night audit at a local Holiday Inn. Ran and built the kennel during the day from 8 in the morning till 6 at night. And at uh, in between 6 and 11, I'd walk neighborhoods and hand out flyers. For the kennel? I, huh? For the kennel? Yeah. I would hand out flyers. I, I'd had these little plastic bags with dog biscuits. And I'd walk up and knock on a door and I'd say, do you have a dog? And if they said no, I said, okay. And I'd leave. And uh, if they had a dog, I said, here, here's a bag of biscuits, you know, a couple of biscuits for you. Oh, you got two dogs? Here's two bags. And I'd chat up the kennel. I think I walked every uh, community in the in the Pasadena Glen Burnie area, Annapolis, Maryland area, and at the same time built every single run chain link panels. I built every single one of them myself and built the <clears throat> Another one of my teachers was George Ward. He never knew it. But we stood, when I was working with Jenny, we stopped at George Ward's place. And I'd never seen a kennel like his. It was a box kennel. It was a terrier box kennel. And I'm 17, 18 years old. And I said, you know, uh, why don't you just have slide doors? George says, no. He said, I want hands on my dogs every day. Yeah, that's what he taught me too. He says, you got to have your hands on them. He says, you got to be able to go out doing those runs and see the poop. He says, you got to be able to feel that dog if he needs an extra half pound or half pound less. So I built a sporting box kennel for my show kennel. Yeah. And every, every one of my show dogs was walked out every day. Three times a day, they went out. And the runs were built specifically for the breeds. Setters, we had long tail runs. So they whacked their tails. Every setter run was eight feet wide. It was 28 foot long. Do you know why it was 28 foot long? Why is that, George? <laughs> <laughs> if they were shorter than 28 feet, the dog would bounce off the end. He would run and bounce off the end. Yeah, yeah I get it. If they were longer than that, they would gallop the whole, they wouldn't trot. But I could make 14-foot panels, put two of them together, 28 feet, and a dog would trot. And... That's how the, that's how I built. And then I had short tail runs, which were the Springers and English Cockers, and they didn't. They could be narrower, but they were still twenty eight feet. So it was probably the only show kennel like that. I don't. I don't ever remember anybody's show kennel, except maybe my daughter's Jane's down in Florida. I don't know where she learned it from, but. Uh. Yeah. Well, I went to Fieldstone a couple of times. I don't know if you remember. I remember being in your office and there was a picture of Yank on the wall. Yes, I remember that. I took it off the wall, put it on the couch, and took a picture of it. <laughs> of what? Of Yank going in the group of the garden. Oh, oh. <laughs> yeah, that was, uh, well, first of all, <clears throat> I had to win the breed over Janie Forsyth with Legend of Gale. Jeez. <laughs> you know, that's, that's tough. And um, 
It was under one of Janie's mother judges. <laughs> and Janie walked out of the ring. Janie was in tears. You know, it was. And then in the sporting group, um, the group was Joe Tacker. I remember that. And Joe Tacker had beaten Yankee in a breed twice before. So in between the breed and the group, I did some fancy trimming and trimmed them more like a Gordon than an Irish. I showed him like a Gordon in the ring and he handed me the ribbon. He says, I like this. I says, I like this dog better than that old dog you were showing. He said, I didn't, I didn't care for him. <laughs> I said, thank you very much, sir. And I ran like hell with that ribbon. <laughs> and then I had one of your damn Canadian, Canadians beat me for best in show. Uh-oh. It, it was with an old English sheepdog. Oh, Malcolm. Malcolm, <laughs> yeah. Good, good, good friend of mine. <laughs> And I walked up to congratulate him, and he was a Yankee fan. He absolutely loved Yankee. And he, I said, congratulations, buddy. He says, I'm sorry, George. <laughs> <laughs> I said, don't be sorry, relish it, you know, so. Yeah, Malcolm. So um, what's your favorite breed then, George? It's a tough one. I guess you could say the English pointer. Yeah. Because they're gentlemen. I mean, every pointer that I've had has been a gentleman. My daughter, Jennifer, breeds pointers. And they're all ladies and gentlemen. They love kids. Um, they're, they're just a great, a great breed. Um, they're, uh, as an example, they're always sitting there beside you with their head on your chair. Yeah. Behind me here, there's a statue of a pointer on an empty chair. Got his head on an empty chair. That was done for a very good friend of mine, Mike Zolo, who went best to the garden with deputy. When he passed, Dame Rebolte did this bronze. Marianne bought a copy of it for me. They, when Damer does something, she only makes 10. That's it. So I got, for, as a Christmas present, as I'm opening the package, there's my dog, Pointer Johnny, Margetta's Johnny Appleseed, who Mike Zello showed at the Futurity at the National and won the Futurity with him. <laughs> the same day as he went best to breed with Bees Knees. And I'm opening it, and here I'm looking at this pointer statue, looking at this empty chair. There's my pointer with his head on my chair arm. And I said, really, Ann, are you trying to tell me something? <laughs> <laughs> no, it would be the pointer. Now, the pointer is not... That's my favorite breed, not my favorite dog yeah. of all time. Of all times, of the dogs you showed, who's your favorite dog? As a person, personality, Yankee. All right, Yankee would never quit. Uh, his first best in show, it was uh, like 105 degrees, 100% humidity. And I asked him to go and, and he never stopped and he probably won because of that. And it was a, he was a great person. Person that he loved me. He showed for me. My favorite dog to show, no brayer. Winslow the Foxhound. Oh yeah. <laughs> And yeah, he looked like fun. He was a fun, yeah, but uh, I was just there for the ride. He didn't, I mean, you know. Not at first. Huh? Not at first. Oh, no, no, no. 
you, you, when I first got him out of the pack, he had never had a lead on. <laughs> uh, all he ever did was hunt fox for a living. He was four and a half years old. <laughs> I put a lead on him. He says, what the hell are you doing to me? <laughs> I bet. And he went upside down all four feet straight up in the air, and uh, that was it. Took me nine months. And two days reading books at the AKC library by Huntsman, and then spending time at Mr. Stewart's pack talking to Gerald, their Huntsman, on the mentality of the English foxhound, which is absolutely, totally different than any other breed that ever walked. They're raised differently than any other breed. And people don't understand this. You know, uh, uh, the English foxhound is raised as a house dog. They're, they don't, they're not raised in a pack. They're raised as a house dog. And by farmers. And then they bring them back. Uh, they're just called putting them out to walk. And, and to get inside that English foxhound's head, you have to know their history. And this was a hard thing. So it took me nine months just to get him in the show ring. And then it took me another six months to get him to show. I got one best in show picture that of me standing from seven feet. That was the first time I ever had a best in show picture like that done, that I had the guts to do it. <laughs> But then when I, he won the group at the garden, I never laid a hand on him. You know, uh, <laughs> Thelma Brown says, show me the bite, please. I said, teeth, he went, ee! <laughs> so it was, uh, he was my favorite show dog. Not person. Yeah. Not person, show dog. Because he was his own person. I mean, you know, he... He, he was just him. And if I went to a hound show, they used to use him in the hound show, and he still ran opening day at the pack. And I could be three foot away, and he would never acknowledge my presence that I was even there. Yet the huntsman could come to a dog show and stand three feet from him. And he would never acknowledge the huntsman's presence. He knew his job. He had his ducks in a row. Yeah. I have to ask you, because uh, he's one of my all-time favorite dogs, the Cameron Marquis. What was Chance like to have around? He, it was a professional relationship. And the whole, he was a great animal. I shouldn't say this, like I'm going to. If it's no good, I'll, I'll edit it, don't worry. <laughs> no, go okay. ahead. Okay, he, he had one of the greatest heads of any Irish setter, he and his father. He had a gorgeous neck and shoulder. Absolutely fantastic front and hind quarter. He could move like the wind, too much so. I used to have to wear metal golf spikes at outdoor shows just to keep up with him. And he didn't like me. Never showed me any affection whatsoever. He'd be on the table be waiting to go in the ring. And he would be playing with people and throwing his paws at, at him and nuzzling him and everything. And I'd walk by and he'd turn his head. He never showed me any sign of affection whatsoever in two years or two and a half years that I showed him until the day, his last dog show at the garden, he was going home back to Canada. And I went into his big old crate to say goodbye and he gave me one lick. And that was the only time he ever showed me any affection whatsoever. It was strictly a professional relationship well he's one of my all-time favorites i have pictures of you showing him when i was when i was a kid i would go and take pictures of you showing chance so. hey. oh. he was a great he was a great dog it was um he was different he was ahead of his time 
Uh, he, the first time anybody had ever seen a coat like his or ears like his. Ears for sure, my God. Yeah, you know, yeah, you know to a fault, but you know, it was, it was something that, um, it was so much fun and he loved the crowds. And I always let my specialist dogs play with the crowds. You know, most handlers, they don't want the, heaven forbid that the people outside the ring should touch their dog. You know, well, that's so stupid. Who claps for the dogs when they're in the ring? The people outside. So you make <laughs> friends with them. You know, use your head, stupid. <laughs> well, you know that. <laughs> I've watched you show your dogs. And, you know, he'd stick his head out and he'd nuzzle. He'd love little kids and, and, and that type of thing. And of course, the kids loved him. So it come time for him to gate in the ring. Man, everybody's hooping and hollering, which was one of his downfalls. Because the more people clapped, the crazier he got. It's almost to the point where I couldn't control him, especially in the best in show ring. Yeah. So... One day I called Frank Sabella. And I've known Frank Sabella forever. When I, I knew Frank Sabella when he had, first had Andy Clark show his dogs, and he didn't know the front end of a dog from the back end of a dog. And he showed a, a white standard poodle command performance when best to show it to guard with. That was a crazy dog. He'd hear the clapping and he went nuts. And I called Frank and I said, what do I do? How do I control him? He says, you can't. He says, you win by the sword, you die by the sword. And just thank God for those good days. Yep. And that's the you way You taught me that. Huh? You taught me that. Did I do that? Yeah, you did. Uh, no, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, in, in those days, Handlers didn't mind helping other handlers, even if they were competitors. Um, there are so many, I had so many handlers come to me and ask how to do something. Let's say they were specialized in terror. And that, that, I would come and I would help them. And um, there was a, there was a lady from New Jersey. Uh, she's the wife of Gunther Bear, the uh, terrier handler. She showed Afghan hounds. She had an Afghan hound. She couldn't get the tail up on. Gorgeous dog. And I said, I'll show you how to get the tail up. She came to me. I'll show you how to get the tail up if you. Promise not to tell Gunther. And she, she says, okay. So that day I showed her how to get the tail up. And she beat me for best in show that day <laughs> <laughs> with my setter. But I felt good because it was like I went best in show for God's sake. I understand that. And it was, I didn't mind teaching people um, because then I, I felt like then their success I was a part of. I don't know whether that makes sense or not. But no, it definitely does. I, I've the, had that same feeling. So the, You know, it's, there's just too many, you know, they want to keep things all secretive and all that sort of, of crap. But uh, over the years, I had so many handlers help me and so i figured i'd you know give something back yeah, of course on that same topic what advice would you give a new handler or somebody who wants to be a handler or young handlers what was that again on the same topic of that what what advice would you give new handlers george apprentice at least four to five years if you want to be any good at it yeah 
If you want to be a hot shot, flash in the pan, go out and show right out of juniors. Oh, I would tell them, first of all, go to college. Or go to school, tech school, something to fall back on. Because you don't know what's going to happen as in life. And you got to have something to fall back on. My, my daughter, Jane, went to college. Jane Myers. Yeah. You know, she turned out to be a pretty good handler. <laughs> <laughs> and, but she, people didn't realize that she went to college and was, she had a, she was a cytogeneticist at Johns Hopkins Hospital. And been doing pro, uh, research on birth defects and chromosomes and genes and all that type of thing. And to this day, she still keeps up her accreditation and everything. That if she she can go back to she can go back to being a histotech and being a, a slide cutter and that type of thing. But after she worked at Hopkins, she comes to me, she says, I'm going to Florida to mom's to be a dog hammer after seven years at Hopkins. And I said, be happy, be good at it. Well, if you know Jane, she's happy. And she was good at it. <laughs> you know, but that's too many of these kids, they come out and they, they don't, and also go to work for more than one handler. And go to work for a handler, not to try to make, not try to make you into another one of them. And there aren't very many people like that. Actually, this day and age, there's not many handlers that can afford a full-time assistant, like it used to be. But the um, that was one of the advantages I had was the different people that I worked for it showed me different sides of the business. But that's what I would advise young. Also, also too, <clears throat> these kids coming out of juniors, they're going to be handlers. They have no idea how to care for a dog on a road, first aid on a dog on a road. Um, they don't under understand that. And like one time we were down in on the Deep South Circuit, and I had a springer that went was going to die. What do I do? Well, I have a good assistant with me, Dougie Hallway. He showed the dogs, and I went to the University of Alabama or Florida or something with the dog, and we pulled him out. It was Felicia's etching. He ended up winning a bunch of best in shows along the way, but. Yeah, all of, an important part of our job. Yeah, it was, you know, twice a year I got, went paid for my veterinarian's time and got an up, update on first aid. And four times a year, my employees went and got, because of the boarding kennel. No, oh, that's a great idea. And, and, and then twice a year, that vet would restock my first aid kit. And at dog shows, hands would come to me, not the vet at the show. They come to me. What do you got for this? What do you got? You know, you know. <laughs> and I don't know how many times I had to tube an Irish setter who had bloated. Once I did a bloat needle on one. Veterinarian standing there watching me didn't know what the hell I was doing, and he almost fainted. <laughs> I said, didn't they teach you some vet school? He says, no. I said, well, you got better find yourself another vet school, son. <laughs> so anyway, that's part of what you got to be a part veterinarian. You got to be part mechanic, part carpenter, part plumber, part electrician. Um, you have to be a, at least an auto mechanic so you can get underneath there and fix those things because you can't afford to pay somebody. Or at least know somebody that can help you. <laughs> somebody that can help, right, right. That's that's right. So what, what year did you retire, George? 1991, June 21st. 
And then you started doing your seminars, which you become world famous for. Well, I, I had done seminars before, but not on a weekend basis. Yeah. I tried it out a couple of times. Uh, decided I didn't want to go on the Florida circuit anymore. So in Florida, uh, during January, I would do one or two. But normal before that, I did eight week courses. My first seminar that I taught was in 1955, after I won juniors at the Garden for the Potomac Boxer Club. Two of those people in that class went on to be top boxer handlers. So. Um, so actually, I've been a teacher for a while. And I, I love teaching. I, I loved the interaction. And you can, you can teach the basics in one day. Actually, in a half an hour, I can teach anybody how to set up a dog. It takes forever to teach them how to show one. People don't understand this. So what do you think is your uh, biggest achievement in the, in the sport then? Is it teaching or is it showing? What is it? As a teacher, my biggest. What is your biggest achievement in this, this sport of dogs? As a teacher. No, no. What is your biggest achievement? What do you, th what do you think you're, you're what, what, are you most, what are you most proud of? As a teacher. Okay. As a teacher. As a handler, I didn't win Jack. My dogs did. Mm -hmm. I didn't win that. I hate it when I hear handler say, well, <laughs> show. Bull crap, buddy. You didn't go best in show. Your dog did. He allowed you to hold on to the end of the lead. <laughs> you know that? You got that feeling? You know, and... Uh, there's only two things I ever won myself. Only two. One was best juniors at the garden and being voted into the Professional Handlers Association Hall of Fame. That's it. <laughs> My dogs are the ones that did it. I know. And, but I want to be known as a teacher, um, even though... I taught differently than most people, but I'm so proud of accomplishments. I, I've got four students, five students have gone best in show at Madison Square Garden, plus four other ones that I helped along the way that they would come and ask me for advice or whatever. Um, I have one of my assistants as an Albury judge, Liz Muthard, very proud of her. Yeah. It's, you know, it's, and you can, you can see watching her judge. I can see me teaching her how to put hands on a dog. That's what I'm proud of. I'm proud of over 300 of my students winning Albury Best in Shows or or national specialties. That's incredible. That's what I'm proud of. Um, am, am I proud of being able to hold on to a couple of dogs that went best in show? Yeah. But somebody else had to breed them. Good Lord had to make them look pretty. I didn't do that. Did I help along the way? Yeah. Sure, yeah. You know, did I, um, the other thing that I'm most proud of and part of my teaching is my philosophy on teaching, uh, on, on training a dog. Too many handlers train their dogs to show like they handle which is the biggest mistakes, not mistake, because there's a lot of them that have been very successful, 
and I, I call them great mechanics. Your old boss was one of the greatest dog mechanics that ever walked, Bob Stebbins. A great mechanic. Every bloody dog he showed, he showed exactly the same way. He showed a golden retriever like a Doberman Pinscher. You know that. You were there. That's so funny because he would often look at the schedule and say to me, okay, we have a break between 12 and 1. You go watch somebody. You go watch George. You go watch Gene Blake. You go watch – he always made me go watch somebody. Oh, yeah. He was – I mean, he, he was one of my best friends. He was one of my best friends. Uh, I, I was sickened when – what happened to him. Yeah. Um, and I was lucky enough his mother allowed me to do his eulogy. Uh, when I was having the same problem he did, he called me when I was in the hospital every day. He and Perry Phillips, the only two. But anyway, to get back to the training, if I got a dog in the show, I had a training yard. It was about a half an acre, fenced. I had a chair in the middle. I go out there and sit in that chair and watch the dog for maybe three, four days, maybe a week, maybe two weeks. And I saw what he liked and what he didn't like. And then I would use that. And I would show the dog to him. Not to what I wanted, I showed to what he wanted. I know I've seen you do the same thing. Well, I wonder where I learned that from. <laughs> I have not a clue, probably some old guy you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you were talking previously about um, being yourself. I don't know if you remember, I, I called you one day and I was asking a bunch of questions and we were talking and finally you said to me, don't try to be the next me. He said, try to be the best. You said, you said, try to be the best you. You remember yes. telling me that? Absolutely. And yeah. that was about the same time I sent you a yellow sweater. <laughs> yeah, and I that, have that yellow sweater. <laughs> no, I told you that. You came down to watch me teach a seminar. The same place that picture was taken. Yeah, yeah. And it was... Uh, there's some advice is don't try to be me, be you. Yep, yes, you told me. Don't try I to be the next that. me. Be I told you. Same, same thing, Corky Vroom came in and watched three of my seminars before he went off to teach seminars. But I gave him the same advice. And Norma Smith, I gave her the same advice. Of course, she, she couldn't be another me. She's too tall. She's not short enough. <laughs> oh, all of us. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but today's judges, George. But, you know, that's uh, I, I, I try to get all of my assistants try to teach that. Yeah, my one assistant, Dougie Holloway. There'll never be another Dougie Holloway, yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> you know, he's his own person, but you know, one of the things I tried to, I said, don't try to be me. Don't try to trim like I do. Trim like you do. And develop. Take the time to develop your own style. There's a, a young fellow that used to work for you. I tried to get him to do it. Develop his own style. Don't copy anybody else. Do your own thing. Um, David White. Did you know David White? I knew David, yeah. He ended up being a great handler of certain breeds. Um, and, and another, God rest his soul, Andrew Doyle, Andrew Doyle's his own person. He could never be me. <laughs> he, <laughs> yeah. he was skinny enough, you know. <laughs> Andrew and I traveled a lot together. It was fun. <laughs> oh, yeah. And don't be, never be another Andrew. Andrew had, Andrew, we called him Andrewisms. <laughs> hey, Andrew, where's... We're something. He says, over yonder. <laughs> now, over yonder could be two foot away. It could be 20 miles down the road. 
when when Andrew came to work for me, he was uh, from Danville, Virginia, and and you talk about a a redneck. I mean, from the bowels of Central Virginia, and. So he, he had an English Springer Spaniel. He wanted to be a dog handler. Are you there? I'm here. Oh, okay, because I'm not seeing you move. I'm okay. uh, listening, George. <laughs> okay, so I'm showing him how to give a bath to a dog, to a Springer. And I said, now this is how you do an anal gland in the tub. Andrew stood there and he says, sorry, you want me to do what? <laughs> but he was just, um, but he ended up developing his own style. He was his own person, his own trimming. Yeah. It took me three years, maybe four years to get him to stop trimming springers with apple heads and frog eyes. <laughs> but, uh, he finally, you know, I said, and it, when he, he got his first best in show on a Springer, he called me up and said, you'll notice in the picture, there's no frog eyes or apple heads. <laughs> so. And this year with her strong athletic build, her fluid gait and her confidence in the ring, the Beagle by the name of Miss P became the ninth. The best in show is the Beagle. Congrats, Miss P, on winning the 139th Westminster Best in Show. We're proud you're continuing the Purina Pro Plan tradition. Purina Pro Plan, nutrition that performs. Uh, judges, what do you think of the how the new the judging process? This you take a judge like Eddie Biven, one of the greats. He, I, I, I put him in the same classification with Al Rosenberg. And he's a true student of breed type does not like excessive anything and you can always predict what he does whether you enjoy it or you know, whether you agree with him or not he's consistent he had to give up his judging at the garden because this last year because of a bad back he would have probably done it if he could have judged those breeds on a ramp and there's, there's a, so much talent out there at this time. There's so many judges that haven't applied to uh, people that haven't applied to judge because their backs or their, their arthritis or whatever won't allow them to do it. And the AKC is just sitting on it. And yet they'll let people that know how to work the system that, you know, uh, I wouldn't let him me. I wouldn't let him buy a goat for me for that. <laughs> you know, and, and that's the way I always let me say. You know, what do you think of this person as a judge? And you, you know, how I determined whether it was a good judge or not? Would I hand him ten thousand dollars in cash and go buy me a dog? How many of those are out there that you would do? It's true. Yeah. Yet there are a lot of people out there that I would get, happily give $10,000 to, um, and you know, and there are a lot of old hammers were like that. There's a great dog man, Bobby Fowler. Did you know Bobby Fowler? Yes, yes. Great dog man. I would show him my new special dog. Every time, but I got a new one. To get a, a feeling, you know, yeah. his thoughts. There was another handler, I'm not going to name him because, but, because he's now a judge, that I would show him my dog. If he liked him, I sent him home. <laughs> you don't tell us. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, the, no, you don't want to know who it is. No. Maybe someday I'll tell you. But, as an example, he told me my foxhound was a pet. Yankee would never win a breed. Mark Key would never win a breed. 
Okay. But he there was a Springer that he looked at. And he loved them. I sent him back to wherever he came from, and another hammer showed him and never won a breed. But I mean, it was a standing joke, you know, with uh, but there, there is really so much talent out there that um, could be utilized. And uh, I think part of the judging problem is too many dog shows, that they have to have the judges to be able to judge these shows or otherwise, you know, they're not gonna, they're not gonna have anybody. But they're, they're not utilizing the possible talent that is out there. There's too many people applying for judges <clears throat> as judges because it's their one time in their life they have something that they can tell somebody what to do and make a judgment upon somebody or a dog. They don't do it for the love of the sport. They don't do it for the love of the breed. They do it because there's a chance for them to show how great they are. And that's wrong. That's wrong. We've always had it like that, had people like that, but the, we didn't have as many of them as we have now today. Okay, I'll shut up on that now. <laughs> well, well, I have one more question for you, George. Yes, sir. If you were, if you, if you hadn't been showing dogs or involved in dogs, what do you think you would have done for a living? I would have been a scientist. I would have, as I told you, I had two merit scholarships. When I graduated from high school, <clears throat> my lowest SAT score out of 800 was 760. And that was taking physics, chemistry, calculus, data. In those days, they had a whole raft of different ones. I loved science, loved it. I mean, I, I just, Maybe that's why I threw did a lot of my handling was done basically scientifically and also why I was able to teach myself how to program computers and have canine by software, which uh, I, I enjoyed very, very, very much. Uh, my, my brother, I have to bring this up, my brother Bill, is, is a better animal trainer than me. We would compete in juniors. I'd practice three or four days a week. He wouldn't practice. I go first in juniors, he goes second, but he'd push me and he wouldn't touch a dog. He can train a cat to do anything. Yeah. There's people like yeah. that. But he had to go to prep school before he got into Tufts University. He, he now is a, a head scientist for the company Jewel that makes the vape stuff. Makes what? Sorry, and again. For, he's head scientist for Jewel Vapor, Vape. Oh, okay. Okay. He used to be senior research scientist for Raychem. He's got, I don't know how many... He's got a couple of PhDs, four master's degrees, you know, and yet I was a scientist in the family. He wasn't, but he enjoyed science and I enjoyed dogs better. So we went where our love was, not where necessarily where our expertise was. But I, I would have been in a science, science business or computer business or something like that. Any last closing remarks you want to say before we say goodbye? Yes. Something that's very dear to my heart 
There's people that are showing dogs. Always keep in mind, dogs are folks. Dogs are folks. If you go and you use that philosophy, whether you're a breeder, an owner, a handler, or a judge, you'll go far. But too many people in the dog game re think of them as inanimate objects or things. And I think this, that denotes a great dog person uh, from a schmuck. <laughs> That's a little tough, but uh, you know, I'll, I'll tell you a story one time. Believe it or not, back in the day, I, I used to be a hothead. No. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I was a hothead. And this handler came from California to a show in Roanoke, Virginia, showing a dog for a very famous person, a terrier. And I, I beat them for best in show. And I'm going back to my truck. Your dog beat them. Excuse me, my dog beat them. <laughs> gotcha. You got me all those times. I gotcha. <laughs> I gotcha, yeah. <laughs> so um, he is, his dog acted up a little bit in the show ring. Yeah, he's about six foot one, six foot two. And he's just has this poor little was either a Welshie or a Lakey, I forget. And he's just beating the hell out of him. And I had somebody hold my dog. And I went down and I took the dog away from him and handed the lead to somebody. And I picked him up and I slammed him against the wall. And I said, don't you ever do that. I said, if I hear that you ever do that again, I said, I'll be on the next plane and you'll be in serious trouble. It's something I wouldn't tolerate. And Dougie Hallway is the same way. I think I taught him that. <laughs> but just remember, dogs are folks. They got feelings or people. Yeah. They have feelings. They have good days. They have bad days. You know, um, you, I see people showing their dog and they says, and, and they lose and they say, well, he didn't feel well today. He didn't show. What the hell are they doing in the show ring? Dog doesn't belong to be in there. Or they'll take a dog to a ring and they'll have diarrhea all over the place and they'll take him in the ring and show him for the sake of a dog show. Dogs are folks. That's the, that's the main thing that I would like to leave is dogs are folks. Yeah, they are. You get further asking them than telling them. So huh? You get well, further asking them than telling them. So now where did you hear that? No idea, George. <laughs> Well, huh? we're going to have to go because we're running out of time, George. But I, I really, uh, I thank you for giving me this time to talk to you. Everybody's going to love this, I'm sure. So I, I enjoyed it, and you know, it, you know, we, we could carry. Do I see my book in the background back there? <laughs> yeah, you do. <laughs> it's. Um, I enjoyed it. There's. You know, we could carry this on for another four hours or something. I know we could, I know. <laughs> and we have. <laughs> and we have. But, you know, I just, I think what you're doing is educating the public in so many ways. Is something that and I'm so proud of you for giving, and I've said this in writing and in public, I'm so proud of you for giving back to the dog game that so few people in your position have done. Well, it's all, it's all due to you, George. You instilled that upon me. So. No, it, it's, yeah, but you, you guided it. me. How about that? You guided yeah. me. You guided me. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh, we're frozen. I, 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 yes, I did.
<laughs> and I'm really proud of you on it. No, I appreciate that, George. It means a lot to me. Okay. Well, thank you again, George. And I'm, I'm sure we'll be talking. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure. I, I hope this turns out. Oh, it'll be great. I, there's a couple of spots in there that got that are shut down or whatever. So. No, it'll work out. And, and Give this, my best to Marianne, okay? I will do that. This is Mother's Day, and this yep. is, I, I couldn't I couldn't take her out to Mother's Day dinner, you know. So. Are you gonna make her dinner? Oh yeah, right. <laughs> we have a McDonald's down the road that I can get it through the window or something. You know? <laughs> no, let her make dinner. She makes great dinner. <laughs> no, no, I know she makes great dinner, but she's not. You know, she, she's not gonna do it. Thank you again, buddy. All right, George. Good talking to you. Talk to you soon. Okay. Well, I want to thank George for bringing us into his house and letting us talk. It truly was an honor. Um, they say imitation is the truest form of flattery. Well, thanks, Pops, for uh, letting me have you to emulate. Um, if you like what we're do doing here at Will Alexander's Dog Show Tips, make sure you press the like, share, and subscribe. And if you want to find out what we're doing, uh, you can go to willalexander.net. If you want to send me a message, go to, go to dogshowtips at gmail.com. Thanks for coming by. Appreciate it.